Welcome to the world's number one fitness business podcast for health club owners, gym managers, and fitness entrepreneurs. As always, this will be a great show as we have another expert to help your fitness business and your career. We'd like to thank our premier sponsor, Active Management, for supporting us. And we highly recommend becoming a member of Active Management to strengthen your business in 2016. There are loads of resources members receive, so join the Active Tribe today at www.activemgmt.com.au. Now that's enough from me. Let's welcome the show's amazing host, Chantal. What's on this week's show? Hi, Harper, and happy anniversary, everyone. That's right, we're celebrating 50 shows. I'm so excited and I want to thank you all so much for listening, for subscribing and for sharing the Fitness Business Podcast. The reason we have reached 50 shows is all thanks to you guys, our tribe, our amazing guests and our generous sponsors. So I am sending out hugs and high fives all across the globe this week. Thank you all so, so much. So I guess you're wondering what we have in store for this week's show. Better be something special, right? Well, as you know, we've been asking for your questions over the last few months for our very special Q&A show. And most of the questions that we received related to starting, running and growing group training in a PT studio or a fitness club. So with a topic like that, we turned to a guru of group training, Adrian Antigua, the general manager of Gainesville Health and Fitness in Florida. He has a wealth of experience in group training, so there was no better person to answer the questions that you guys submitted. But first, a few bits and pieces before we jump into this week's show. And since we're in a celebrating kind of mood, then it seems pretty fitting to announce our medal winners for the most shows downloaded in April. And the winners are... Coming in with bronze was Anne Coppins' show 45. Taking out both the silver and the gold for show 47 was Mo Hagen and show 46 was Mo Hagen. So congratulations to both of our medal winners. And don't forget, if you missed any of those shows, you can check them out on fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Just click on the link that says all shows and you can check out all of our shows from one right through to 49. Now, before we chat to Adrian, I wanted to say a big shout out to our awesome sponsor, Tribe Team Training, the complete small group training business system that is helping clubs make more money without having to sell more memberships. To find out information, check out www.tribeteamtraining.com. This month, we have an awesome prize for people who subscribe to the show notes at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com or engage with the Fitness Business Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or even emailing us. Do it and you may be this month's winner. Now it's time for this week's guest. That's right, Harper. As mentioned, we have collected all of your questions and we've called in an industry expert to help us answer them. Adrian Antigua is the general manager and sales manager for Gainesville Health and Fitness in Florida, USA, which includes a 75,000 square foot club with over 28,000 members. That is huge. After graduating from university in Florida, Adrian quickly discovered his passion for fitness and the power of company culture and the customer experience, sharing his insights via blogs on sites such as clubsolutionsmagazine.com. He's been with the company now for almost 10 years. And when it comes to group training, he is our go-to guy. Enjoy the show, tribe. Welcome to the show, Adrian. Thank you, Chantal. Happy to be here. Very, very exciting. Now, um, Tribe, I've actually got Adrian sitting next to me, which is quite a treat because he has come all the way over from the States to join us for the Filex weekend. So it's very exciting to have you here. Now, Adrian, as we get going, let me ask you this. Are you ready to fitspire our FBP Tribe on group training today? Let's get it done. Excellent. Okay, so let's start off by setting the scene at Gainesville Health and Fitness around group training. Okay. Um, so today's quick five five is going to be all focused around that area. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay, so let me ask you this. How many classes do you run per day? 
Yeah, so for tribe specific, we are we have 10 to 12 different tribe classes. We also have CrossFit and Pilates in our club. So in CrossFit specifically, we, we average about eight classes and Pilates, we average about eight as well. Okay, and how many clients do you have in those group training per week? Sure, so um, with our tribe specific programs, um, we have over 150 in those mm -hmm. program, in that program in itself. CrossFit, just over 100 and Pilates over 110. Can you share with us how much they pay? Sure. Um, so for tribe specific, it's just really dependent on how off which program they're in. Mm -hmm. um, so for uh, the programs that are two times a week, they're paying one hundred forty nine dollars US dollars, and then uh, that's for a six week program. For three times a week, they're going to be paying one hundred ninety nine dollars uh, for six week program. CrossFit it really ranges just as well uh, for how many sessions that they're going to pay for on a month basis. So on a monthly basis, it could run from anywhere from fifty nine dollars for four sessions a month up to one hundred forty nine dollars to unlimited sessions. There. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, for Pilates, again, we have some ranges there, very similar to our CrossFit model and the way we price that based on the sessions that are, are going to go and use. So it's from $69 for four sessions up to $179 for 12 sessions. Great. And tell us this, how much do you pay your instructors? Um, so each program is actually uh, set up fairly the same way in regards to the pay. So mm -hmm. we do a $25 an hour pay structure. And then for every uh, every client that they have over six people, they get a $3 bonus per, per head. Interesting. Really mm -hmm. interesting model. I think, Adrian, it sounds like you've just described the biggest health club on earth. <laughs> Do you want to yeah. maybe share with our tribe a little bit about Gainesville Health, just yeah. so that we get a picture of what, what the club looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've been in the industry for about 35 plus years now. And so we have had the original owner of our clubs for that entire time as well. His name is Joe Cerulli, who's really just what I consider one of the godfathers of fitness. And so our clubs are multi-purpose clubs. Uh, we had three facilities. Our main club is about 80,000 square feet. Our Tioga club is about 25,000 square feet. And our women's center club is about 10,000 square feet. And so uh, across those clubs, we have everything. I mean, in regards to aquatics, uh, group exercise, spin, all those offerings that we talked about a little bit earlier, as well as uh, free weights. I mean, you name it, most likely we have it. And then across all those three clubs, we have just about 27,000 members. Wow, mm -hmm. 27,000 members. Correct. That is absolutely huge. Well, Adrian, you successfully passed the quick fire five questions. So let me start by asking you, what were you guys doing for group training before you implemented tribe team training? Yeah, so basically we had a wide variety of offerings. You know, we were constantly evaluating what we what we could offer, or constantly searching for the next big thing. And so we had a, a bunch of programs like boot camp, um, you know, wedding ready, uh, you know, buns and and guns. I, I can't remember <laughs> all combo. the different names. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> basically you come up with a name just to come up with the next big you know yeah. class because a class would basically you come to a peak and then after it peaks out it fizzles out again mm -hmm. because you're constantly have to write up the programs try to figure out the next thing and so we were going jumping from thing one one program to the next it seemed okay and so what sort of made you want group training in the club at all yes and so basically we wanted to just provide more training options for our, our members through the guidance of our personal trainers, really to motivate people to reach their fitness goals. We want to just make sure that they had more things to choose from. And so it wasn't just group exercise uh, classes or the circuit training program that we have on the line um, in our clubs uh, or versus uh, personal training. So mm -hmm. we want to create a middle ground, but also have something consistent. So that way really any trainer can come into and do that program in itself. So it wasn't, you know, I know it's going to be trainer dependent, you know, in regards to their emotions and things of that yeah. nature, how they're going to connect with their clients and all that. But at least the programming would be consistent. So one person can go into that class and maybe another person can go in that same class and still go through that same sort of thing. Yep, have that expectation, yeah. know what they're going in for. So what about when it comes to design and physical space? How did you actually find the space within the club to run that group training? Sure. So um, for us, we were actually 
going through a remodel of our clubs. We had what we called a mind body space, which we just weren't getting the most out of. And so we decided to repurpose that space completely and use that space for tribe specific in itself. For the other programs in the club, we, we had some, some extra space available. So for example, CrossFit, CrossFit at our Tioga location, we had an outdoor space that we just weren't using at all. And it was just sitting there. And so we just wanted to make sure we, again, we capitalize on that space. How do, can we make more use of it? Put a cage out there and it was uh, fantastic. And same thing for Pilates. We, we, put, we made a room specific for Pilates. And I think that's important to make those specific places in the club and brand those specific places in the club to really differentiate them from everything else that you have to offer. Adrian, when you say brand those spaces, do you want to tell us how, how you have gone about doing that? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, it's it's everything from the whole room design to how you title the room in itself and really just how you present the space to where it's not just another space within your club. It's something separate in itself. You know, there's a lot of talk about boutiques and clubs, yeah. or not in clubs, but boutiques outside of clubs yeah. being the new impact yes. on the health and fitness industry that boutiques are taking over. And so one of the things that we've done is taken a stand to really make sure that we let people know we offer those same things. Mm -hmm. And so when we were doing the remodels of our clubs, the owner of our clubs read this book called The New Rules of Retail. And in that book, it talks about really how you should distinguish one product from the next. So if you go to a place like Neiman Marcus or you know, really any high-end mall for that matter, a uh, department store, you have specific segments in that store. You know where the Michael Kors section is in the store or you know where the Chanel section is yeah. in the store. And so it's kind of following that model. So when you go into our clubs, there is a specific section for it. So it, it looks different, it feels different. You're gonna have a different experience in that space mm -hmm. because you know what you're going to expect based off the way it's branded. Quite often on the show, we've mentioned those boutique sort of studios that you're talking about, like Mile High Run Club mm -hmm. and the Cycle Ones and I think Row House and stuff like that. So we're hearing about the emergence of those, but you guys have been able to be a larger scale club and introduce those specific areas within the, the environment of your club. Absolutely. And, and I think it's important that you, you really just stay on, you know, the tip of what's going on in the market. Joe's a genius in that he's always looking at what's next. And so we've been working on this remodel in our clubs for over 10 years now yeah. with this intent to really, again, define the spaces in the club. Wow. So it's been it's been fantastic for us. That's amazing and interesting to see just how much time goes into that planning period mm -hmm. to get it right. Let's just talk briefly about tribe team training. And, sure. and as our tribe know, they are one of our wonderful sponsors of the show. Tell us what made you select Select tribe team training for your club? Sure. So the ultimate thing of what tribe offered for us was the consistency in the, in the small group training arena. You know, again, as I mentioned earlier, we were trying to recreate something every single time we would have a program. You know, it would be what's writing out the program of how's wedding ready going to look next month? What's the workout going to be this week? Or what's the workout even going to be 30 minutes from now? And so when, one of the great things Tribe does is helps to create that consistency and that regimented program to where we already know what it is, you know, months in advance for that matter. And so that was the great reason why we, we ultimately decided to use a program like Tribe. So it gives you that long-term planning? Absolutely. Yeah. And again, the consistency of a trainer to be able to use that program from one person to the next. So with that in mind, how did your existing instructors feel about teaching a program that they didn't necessarily create themselves? Yeah. So I wouldn't be honest to say if they were all excited about <laughs> it. However, you know, what the one thing that they did realize is that we were making things simpler for them. You know, the reason why I say they weren't excited about it at first is because you know, personal trainers are a different breed in themselves. You know, they're very proud of their training styles, mm -hmm. how they want to coach somebody with the programs that they create. Uh, you know, they're very passionate about that. And I respect that. Mm -hmm. However, what, again, what we wanted to make sure we did for clients was make sure there was a sense of preparedness mm -hmm. and that sense of continuity across the board. So they understood that. They understood that we were making things easier for them. And as they progressed, as they've gone through the training sessions of how to become a tribe coach, mm -hmm. they understood that. Yeah. And, you know, they're very receptive of that moving forward, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Adrian, let's focus more on the, the actual selling of the program. And mm -hmm. I've got a question here from one of our FBP tribe from Western Australia in, in Australia. And they asked, how do you convince members to pay for a class when previously they've just received group fitness for free or as part of their membership? So yeah, how do you sell that into your members? Sure, so uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, we really, really try to differentiate the small group programs that we offer, CrossFit, Tribe, Pilates specifically, even personal training for that matter, differentiate those from the rest of the group exercise offerings that we do have. And so some of the ways we do that is first with the small groups is limiting the size of the class. You know, in a group exercise class, you can have anywhere from 10 to even 150 people mm -hmm. going to a class, uh, depending on the program in itself and the popularity of the program. And so limiting the size of the classes allows to have that sense of that one-on-one -on -one attention. The next thing that we also do is also make sure that everybody understands that they're gonna be trained with a personal trainer, that they're gonna be training with somebody who is certified, not to say that our group exercise instructors are not certified, but it's just that next level of certification, of knowledge that they no, know that they're gonna be getting, as well as the attention that they're gonna be getting in their programs. And so I would say that that's the biggest thing, the two biggest things, and the third biggest being, again, creating that specific space creating that again that boutique within your club yeah. and letting them understand that that would be their own space you know a group exercise room is used for hundreds of different classes throughout the week and so having that one space that is just for them again makes it special for that individual so how long then did it actually take to create traction and to create impact with this changeover to the small group training? Sure. So I would say with Tribe specifically, when we launched Tribe, it probably took, we, we, we did a lot of build up for it, first of all. I mean, a lot of uh, advertising for mm -hmm. it to make sure that the, all the staff also knew about it, um, as well as the as our members and our guests and things of that nature. So we did a ramp up. We did several trial weeks just to make sure people got to experience it a little bit. But I ultimately say it took about three to six months to really get people to see what was what was being done, mm -hmm. and for also people to get the results what they were looking right. for, so that way they could share that information too. Because yep. results are going to be the biggest key factor for those referrals moving forward. And so that's where that three to six month period really starts to work in as far as the exponential growth of the program. And how about when you initially made those changes to like the Pilates and having the dedicated areas for each of those specialties, how long did that kind of take to get to gain traction? I would probably say about the same. Yeah. You know, again, it's at first with those programs, it's really just figuring out, well, before you even get the programs, you figure out there's the market for it. And you also figure out the, what the dynamics of what those people are looking for. And so we made sure that there was going to be the market for yeah. it. So it wasn't kind of just shooting the bull and just yeah. see, let's see if we can figure it out from there. So I'd probably say that three to six month mark would probably be applicable to those other two programs too. Okay. I think you've, well, you've touched on this in a kind of way, but this next question comes from Eddie in Ontario, Canada. And Eddie asks, are the best instructors for group training personal trainers or group fitness instructors? <coughs> or is there someone else that I should be looking at? Sure. You know, I think that the best instructors from group training offerings come from really everywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be your group fitness instructors. It doesn't necessarily have to be personal trainers even. So what I think that really what you have to pay attention to is that you're finding somebody that has a passion for that program in itself. And so if they have that passion, that buy-in for that program, they're going to be much more successful than, it, than somebody who's just really doing it just to get the paycheck. Yeah. And so in that sense of things, there's also, you, you do want to look for some key factors. You know, for small group training specifically, you want to make sure it's you, you have somebody that can multitask in that sense mm -hmm. of things. So that's probably one of the basic things you do want to look for in regards to an actual list of things that you're, you're kind of trying to find in an individual um, because there is that multitasking aspect of who you're paying attention to each program um, that you could still focus on one member as well as another, what each member's goals are, so that way you can still reach everyone's ultimate goals in their fitness area. And are your instructors employees? 
Yes. They are. And why do you choose to employ rather than subcontract? Yeah. We got that question uh, quite a bit here, yeah. in Alex, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, and the reason why we did that is because it's extremely difficult, I think, when you subcontract a trainer or an employee of any sort, for that matter, to really make sure that they stay within your core values and your culture. Um, and so for us, we have a quite extensive hiring process. It's not like you can just be the number one personal trainer in the world um, and come in and apply and you're going to get the job. Maybe an exception for a couple of people here and there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we go through an extensive hiring process to make sure that person fits what we believe in. And sometimes we'll even hire people who don't even have a certification right off the bat um, because we know that they're going to be a good fit and you, you could train all those other things. They can get that certification later down the road. Um, and so for us, again, it's, it's ultimately to make sure it's somebody who follows and believes um, what we believe in. Do you reckon that you could give us a little uh, insight into that extensive hiring process that you just mentioned? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So it'll probably take a while, but here, here we go. Um, so for the hiring process for us, it begins with the person com applicant coming in and actually coming in and filling out the application in front of us. Mm -hmm. In that actual application, we're going to be begin screening them right away. And so they're going to meet with one of our trainers or one of our other employees who's going to go through a series of questions just to see if they're a good fit right off the bat. Uh, from there, um, they'll move on to a group ex a group interview. And in that group interview, um, we have actually devised a game to where it's a little more interactive. It puts people in positions to are a little bit uncomfortable to them, for that matter. And so it puts people out of, out of their comfort, comfort zones, which really shows that true individual. Beyond that, uh, would then be go on to a one-on-one -on -one interview with any one of our department managers. And then that one-on-one -on -one interview, we also have a workout that's included in that. And so in the workout, it's not to find out how much how strong you can you lift, you know, how much weight you can lift or anything else that matter. It's it's really just to identify two things, how much effort you're gonna put forth, how hardworking you are, and how well you follow directions. And it's a tough workout, yeah. uh, to say the least. Uh, so we really put people through Did the they test. put you through this workout when you started? Yes, I yeah. did. <laughs> and I didn't feel very well at the very end of it. But um, yeah, and, and we do that on different levels too. Mm -hmm. And so I remember back when, uh, I was interviewing to become a supervisor in our clubs. Mm -hmm. I remember I just about passed out at the end of the that That's the a serious interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, um, the reason why we do that was is to really make sure that the person who we're going to be working with is not going to fall under pressure, that they're not just going to give up when things get tough, and that they can really follow those, those directions from the very beginning. And so you, you'll have interviews where you have to re repeat the things that you have to do every single time on every single machine that they put them through. And so what it allows us to do is really just make sure we really hire hire slow yeah. and fire fast. Yeah. If, and if there's there's going to be people that fall through the cracks, but we'll find them very yeah. quickly. And there's a lot less of them in this process too. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. that, that definitely is an extensive interview process, yeah. but uh, <laughs> done, for, done for good reason. I'd like to try that workout. That sure. sounds good. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so our next question comes from Ricky in Auckland, New Zealand. And Ricky said, we found that when we launched group training that we cannibalised our personal training. Later in the email, Ricky then went on to explain that many PT clients actually stopped personal training and switched over to group training. In your experience, Adrian, has, has that happened for you? Yeah. Um, you know, initially we did have a slight change in our one-on-one -on -one training sessions. Um, however, we made sure to really identify the importance and value of the one-on-one -on -one personal training um, offerings that we have and how it differentiates from the small group offerings mm -hmm. that we have in the club. And there's a great need still for the people that want to do one-on-one -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, there's such there's great value in that still yeah. because not everybody's suited for small group trainings mm -hmm. and so I, what we actually do is when somebody wants to sign up for those programs we have them sit down with somebody who's gonna really kind of tailor them for which program they're gonna be we can suggest would be best for them whether it is gonna be one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. or whether it, that can be small group mm -hmm. also okay so Adrian did you find that offering group training actually attracted new people yeah, absolutely it did. Um, because the reason why I say that is because it, it really created that second tier. Again, it was it created that tier or the option for people that weren't ready to make that direct jump mm -hmm. to that one-on-one -on -one training. And so in that sense, yeah, 
it did attract newer people to the program. The other thing it also did was for the, our, our current personal training clients who maybe wanted to try something else out, it gave them another option too. Rather than dropping out of personal training completely, mm -hmm. it became another option that was maybe more cost effective for them to use a different offering as well. We're still getting a personal trainer, still getting that you know that one on one type atmosphere, even though it's not necessarily one on one, <laughs> which would allow us to keep them longer um, and then get them more of those results that they were looking for. Excellent. Okay, now we actually had three people, not one, but three people asking the same question, so we have to answer this one. We've got. Lisa from Victoria in Australia, Jeff from California in the USA and Edward from Bristol in the UK all asked, what are the benchmarks for retention in group training? Yeah, so I think the first thing I'll say about retention in general is that retention is everything that you do. It's not one specific item. Brent Darden, somebody who I looked up to as well, actually the head of my roundtable groups and just really an overall great guy. He just, uh, in one of his sessions here at Phylex, um, th that's how we started off as one of those sessions, is that retention is not just one key thing. It's everything. And But there are definitely a few key indicators that you want to keep a close eye on. Some of those key things are like class attendance. You know, attendance per trainer is even going to be big. And so also client satisfaction, the retention from one program to the next, how many people have dropped out, how many people have also started in the programs. And so you want to keep a close eye on all those things. Um, so really you just have a better understanding of how your program is doing. What Tribe does also well at is Tribe, with their first week, the first week workout, it creates the basically initial criteria that, um, not criteria, I'm sorry, that's the wrong word, but it, it lets people know where they are. It lets people know where they are as far as their fitness level is concerned. Um, so is it like then, a benchmark? Yes, it yeah. creates their benchmarks. Yep. Sorry, that's the word that's I was looking word. for. So, <laughs> um, it creates the benchmarks for them to know where they are beginning. And the great thing again about Tribe is that at the end of the six weeks, the last week is going to really do that retest again. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be able to see what those results are. And the results are going to be the biggest key indicator of whether or not somebody's going to stay or they're going to leave your program. Absolutely. And if you can get those results, get them moving forward. Yeah, I mean, the likelihood of them staying in your program versus them leaving is exponentially increased. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. can you give us any examples of how you'd actually drive retention uh, in the programs? Yeah, and so... Again, it's everything. Um, mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's tough to name one main thing, but we have a variety of uh, retention strategies in our programs. And one of the best ways to do this is through making sure that the quality and standards of each coach are really being executed and you know evaluated regularly. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is you know we we host community events on a regular basis. Um, you know with our CrossFit arena we have a, what we call a throwdown um, to where it's an event where even if you're not a CrossFit client you can come in and basically compete against other CrossFit clients that we currently have. Mm -hmm. And we also invite other CrossFits in the area to come in too. And so it also, it's a good, it's a good way to have people from all different backgrounds, even our competitors come in um, for that matter. Yeah. Um, and it creates a fun environment for them to just, again, interact with each other a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And some other things we do at workshops on a regular basis. And again, it's, there's so many different things. I, in Pilates specifically, recently we had a client who got sick mm -hmm. and what the uh, instructors did was every single instructor got a card as well as a bouquet of flowers mm -hmm. signed the card for that client went and actually delivered it the card and the flowers in person and to, while she was in the hospital and you know she's going to be a client for life now yeah. um she's going to come back and feeling better and of course and just a matter of no time and she's going to be a client in that program for life you know they, they've created relationships that'll go beyond anything that you could have in any retention strategy yeah. that you can come up with from there great examples that's mm -hmm. really great adrian i want to say thank you so much for joining us on the show today because you have not only answered the questions from our wonderful fvp tribe but you've answered a whole lot more that i've thrown in along the way so thank you so much for okay. your time today it's a great pleasure to have you here in sure. australia well, thank you so much for having me it's great to be here thanks adrian the fitness business podcast is very appreciative of our podcast partners here's a quick word from one of our partners as you know, our goal at the Fitness Business Podcast is to help you grow your fitness business. So I love it when I can tell you about new products, programs, and solutions to help you do just that. 
Our show would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. And one of those awesome sponsors is Visual Fitness Planner. But before I tell you more about them, let me ask you these questions. What is your membership closing percentages? What percentage of your members at the point of sale sign up for a complimentary orientation session? What percentage of your new members actually show up for their complimentary orientation session? And most importantly, what percentage of your membership buys personal training? These are the numbers that you have to be asking yourself and measuring every single day. As the old saying goes, if you're not measuring your numbers, you're not managing your numbers. A club set show close numbers are significantly improved because of the visual fitness planner. The VFP provides a turnkey system for marketing, capturing and integrating new members into a healthy lifestyle change. The VFP automates your existing sales, marketing and orientation systems with the power of its visually impacting technology. VFP calculates a person's health risks for diseases, it predicts their health age, it creates a before and after 3D image of their body and calculates how long it will take to achieve their goals. And in this process, increases your membership and personal training sales and overall member retention. To check out more about the VFP, head over to their website at myvfp.com.au. And of course, a copy of that website link is in today's show notes. Hey Tribe, now given this is an extra special show this week, I thought why not throw in a little bit of bonus content. So I caught up with Max Martin and we had a bit of a chat about his recent visit to the ESSA conference. Now, truth be told, we did go slightly off topic from our normal fitness business banter, but I think you're going to enjoy hearing some of his insights. Okay, it is my absolute pleasure to be welcoming to the show our second guest this week, and it's Max Martin. Now, Max is the Director of Corrective Exercise Australia, which provides continuing education workshops to personal trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, and exercise physiologists. Founder of Movement Screen, a first of its kind iPad based movement screening and assessment software developed to help exercise professionals provide a better service to clients. And Max is also a board member of Fitness Australia. Well, first things first, welcome to the show, Max. Thanks, Chantal. It's my pleasure to be here. Very excited. It is wonderful to have you here. Are you a regular listener of the show? Uh, look, most of the time, I think I've missed a few, but I, I can definitely call myself a regular listener, yes. I'm glad to hear that. Did you happen to know that we are actually celebrating 50 shows this week? Uh, I, I do, and I'm just really privileged to be a part of it. It's a bit of a landmark show, so um, I've been bragging to a few friends about it. <laughs> well, that makes me very happy. That's good. So of the shows that you have caught so far, what would you say would be, say, your top three guests that you've heard so far? Ah, good question. Um, look, I think different ones for different reasons. One of the ones that comes to mind was Sean Bestor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name yeah, the, uh, from Lead Pages. You know, one of the things I was really that highlighted for me was was the timing thing. We were doing a lot of content development for our website. So a lot of the stuff that he said just resonated and guided us in the right direction. But one of the key lines for him was the whole don't wait for the perfect word um, sort of thing. So just write. You know, I tend to get really stuck on the details sometimes, and, and that just really resonated for me. Probably one of my favorites of all of them has been Michelle Saga with uh, um, Don't Sweat. Yeah, no sweat, um, yeah. Great, uh, great interview, that one. Yeah, you know, so really like that, you know, just so much about attitudes of our clients to physical activity and where they come from and the right services for the right outcomes, you know, is high-intensity training really the best thing for all of them? I mean, there was just so much gold there. Was, I've listened to that one quite a few times. Oh, good to hear. And, um, and Lisa uh, Moltman who spoke about sleep. Yes. Um, you know, we'll be touching on that a little bit um, later on today as well. That's one of my really kind of pet topics. I'm talking to clients all the time about the quality of their sleep and the effect of, you know, not enough sleep most of the time for most people. So that was a really good one that I've actually flicked across to quite a few of my clients and say, look, it's not just me saying it. Have a listen to this as well. Oh, I'm so glad you've enjoyed those shows. And Tribe, if you missed any of those shows, just a quick recap. So Sean Bester, uh, who spoke from Lead Pages, they were shows 35 and 36. Michelle Seeger, I'm sure everyone knows this one because I've talked about it so much. It was show 33. Um, 
and Lisa Maltman, as Max mentioned, who talked about Sleep was show 39. So you can always jump back and check out those shows if you haven't heard them so far. Thanks for that, Max. Yeah, pleasure. Now, uh, the reason that we got you on is because I believe that you recently attended ESSA, the Exercise and Sports Science Australia Conference. Correct. And uh, our friend JT from Active Management was uh, was telling me that you were filling up his, um, his social media <laughs> feed with notes from the conference. So I've been abused a little bit by a few people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, that's not a bad thing. So I'm, I'm guessing that uh, given it was a sports science conference, there was probably lots and lots of uh, science stuff in there. And as you know, this is a fitness business show. So do you reckon you could maybe share with us, say, 10 messages or pieces of research or information that you took away that you think our tribe might enjoy? Yeah, get something from. Oh, look, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. You know, one of my kind of little hashtags that I put on some of those is nerd at work, right? <laughs> so it's always for me trying to, to find that mix between the nerdy stuff but then applying it to work. So, yeah, very happy with it. I love um, the sound of that. I love the sound of that. Don't get uh, don't get too nerdy on us. <laughs> that's it, that's it. Look, and I think for, um, for us, one of our big messages is how do we reach the 80% that mm-hmm. don't typically access our services, right? Mm-hmm. So it's looking at... And what is it that we know from a fitness perspective that can help us approach those people that are not already in our gyms? Yeah. Okay. And so probably the first thing that I would share with you, uh, there was um, a presenter that talked about slow versus quick research, mm-hmm. which I found really interesting. Um, you know, and uh, I've heard this from personal trainers a number of times, like, ah, oh, you know, academic research, it's always so slow. It's years behind what we've been doing. You know, we've been phone rolling before the research came out. We've been using feed balls before the research came out. And, and that's what this guy was really talking about, that slow research. Yeah. The interesting thing is that the slow research often comes about because of the quicker research, in a sense, or the quicker innovations that we're actually doing in industry. You know, we're we're always as practitioners, as clinicians, as trainers, we're looking for that best way to serve our clients. And so we're innovative, you know. So we're doing that quick research. How do I solve this problem now? But it's those things that then academic are picking up and then looking at, okay, why does this work? Does it actually work? Does it work all the time? Um, And so in our business, we tend to look at that slow research as the big rocks that help us, in a sense, know that we're on the right track and then we keep building on that. If I can probably bring that, you know, really back down to a business level, Mm -hmm. is I would suggest that we start to think a little bit more from a research framework and start to collect data. Um, I'm seeing some very successful businesses, for example, that are using data from what they do on a day-to-day basis. So, for example, do we help our clients lose weight? Okay, well, how much and how long does it take? Because then we can take that, for example, to GPs and say, did you know that we can help a client lose 10 kilos in three months? And we do that on average. So all of a sudden, that GP has some real confidence on the type of service that we're providing. So collecting data and doing a little bit of that internal research, and it can be soft research, yeah. um, can be a very powerful tool. Okay. I think that sounds like a, a good recommendation and I can see how you've related that back to the business. So that sounds great, Max. Let's keep going. What's number two? Cool. One of the best quotes that I heard, I think, over the conference, and it was three days of you know session after session, was by Stu Phillips, Stuart Phillips, who's a Canadian researcher, mm-hmm. and he talked about hypertrophy, and um, he he dropped a couple of you know bombs like that. One was he just screamed out, you know, muscle matters, you know, and and obviously we know that in a lot of in a lot of gyms there's a very strong weightlifting population yep. but then the cardio population tends to be a lot bigger you know mm-hmm. there's a lot more treadmills there's a lot more bikes and there is gym equipment and his thing was you know we need to build muscle for a number of things and especially from a weight loss perspective mm-hmm. um and, and he he made this quote which um really struck me he said it's, it is unconscionable to ask someone to lose weight via diet alone and what he was saying is, you know, typically people are trying to lose weight and we say it's 70% diet, but the exercise is so important and especially resistance training because we know that muscle is that metabolic engine, which is where we're burning the, the energy all the time. So I think from a business perspective, sometimes putting that research, you know, when we talk about the 80% that are not getting to us, 
often it's because they don't really know their true value that we can bring to them. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think gyms, and and I'm stereotyping, of course, but it's just that, you know, you go and suffer and sweat and you're in pain. And and if I don't want to be an athlete, then maybe it's not for me. Yeah, but most people want to lose some weight. They want to get stronger. They want to live their lives better. So that was one that struck me quite a bit. So what I'm hearing, Max, in that is that that we can potentially, I guess, inform and educate our members or our potential clients more utilising this data. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I think information is one of those key things towards making better decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, as you know, Michelle Saga was talking about. Obviously, there's all these other concepts in there that will affect decision making. But if people don't know why they need to make the right decision, I think we're we're putting up a big barrier in front of them. Yeah. Well said. Um, mm-hmm. So number three, Mm -hmm. Stu Phillips then went on to talk about hypertrophy quite specifically and the amount of protein intake, for example, that we need to be taking. Uh, And this one could be a little bit, um, you know, controversial in a sense because he said, you know, most of the guidelines in most countries are not enough from a protein perspective. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he was talking about is exercise is king from a hypertrophy perspective. So when we're trying to build muscle Mm -hmm. and then he said nutrition is queen. Perhaps a little bit of a sexist and other people's perspective. <laughs> I reckon we're going to get a few emails on that one. Uh, please uh, just send them to uh, send them to you, Chantal. To, to me, to yeah. My, my yeah. So this, you know, what he said is: look, together they rule the kingdom, but always prioritize the king. So always prioritize exercise. Interesting. And you know, and we see this. A lot of people go, oh, you know, what protein shake do I take? And they're really not even lifting heavy enough to get that hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, if I can provide in a very quick summary the feedback, and this is more for the trainers that would be listening to the show, Mm -hmm. we want about a third of a gram of protein per kilogram of body weight per meal. So that's about 20 grams of protein every three hours. And then before going to bed, one load that's twice as big. So we're talking about 40 grams of protein before going to sleep. So it's Three during the day, every three hours, and then twice as much, about 40 grams before going to sleep. Because basically, we've got about eight hours of fasting, you know, and that's when a lot of, we get a lot of that catabolic process in muscle, muscle breaks down. So, you know, again, that education for clients. I think, Max, we've just crossed over from business into uh, personal training nerdiness (laughs) in a a good way. I'll bring it back. I'll bring it back. Bring it back for me. Yep. What what have we got next? Point number four, yep. strength building uh, and hypertrophy for older people. Mm-hmm. Really big message. You know, one of the big things that are, that's affecting the older population, and really by older I'm talking about over 65, 70, really, primarily, and it's this issue of what's called sarcopenia, so mm-hmm. just loss of muscle mass. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the key messages here is, again, how do we start to attract a part of the population that don't tend to go to gyms? You know, and, and one of the things that we see with older people is that often the biggest problem that they would have, and especially as they start to become frail, is, for example, not being able to make it to the toilet. Mm-hmm. You know, the issue is not that they can't chase the bus down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's not that they can't do plyometric training, but it's those basic strength things. So selling strength training to the older population has huge, huge benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, what's your number five? Number five, really three big components of fitness to be talking to people. And and I think for the trainers listening to this, it's going to be, well, of course, Max, we know this. But um, again, I think we don't often sell the benefits broadly enough of all the different types of training. So resistance training and then both moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise and high intensity exercise Mm -hmm. yeah and to touch very quickly on the nerdy stuff it's all coming down to the mitochondrial function right so kind of little bits in the cell that produce energy we know that the moderate exercise increases the number of these things and the high intensity increases the function of them you know so both really really important oh max you love this stuff don't you I, it's, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what? I, I know some of my personal trainers out there, their ears will be pricking up loving loving all this stuff that you're sharing with us. We're, um, we're not exactly sticking to our normal business theme, but I think that's okay. I think we uh, we have our fair share of that, so let's keep going. Okay. I hope you invite me back at yeah. some stage. <laughs> okay. Now the last one uh, or, or the next one, um, VO2 Max of fitness 
best predictor of longevity. So here's a, here's a branding message for businesses. I think if there is ever one, mm -hmm. people want to live longer, but not only do they want to live longer, they want to live good quality lives longer. Yeah, and the research is so, so strong that your aerobic fitness is the best predictor of good quality longevity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interestingly, they're looking at, so if we look at fitness, the opposite being sedentary behavior, so people that are not fit, not moving enough, we could add up the risk of obesity, high cholesterol, and diabetes together, and they wouldn't equate to the risk of not being fit enough. Wow. So fitness, really, really important. So at the end of the day, what are we selling to people? You know, it's not so much about the aesthetics that will capture a certain part of the market, but it's about that quality of life and a long life so that they can enjoy it. Yeah, Max, I think that's a really good point. And, and I think you're right in that that type of information that you've just shared with us is something that we can think about. How do we utilize that uh, when it comes to marketing? In our business, Correct. you know, how do we utilize that information? Where do we weave it in? Is it in, uh, is it in content that we're producing for our website or for our business pages? Um, is it part of the conversation that we're having with our customers? But I think that's some some really good information you've got there. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. And what have we got for number seven? So number seven, I, it kind of sits on in line with number six. Mm -hmm. Um, lack of exercise, and this was one of the big slides that stuck in my head, lack of exercise is responsible for, t for twice as many deaths compared to obesity. Wow. Yeah. So we know that lack of fitness is really important, mm -hmm. but what they did in this really big study, and it was a study of 117,000 Europeans, so massive, massive yeah. study. They followed them over 12 years, and what they found is that irrespective of your level of obesity or weight, so mm -hmm. it didn't matter where your BMI was, or what your waist circumference was, if you were more physically active, you were much less likely to die prematurely. So, you know, the message here is let's attract people that may not necessarily feel very comfortable in a gym setting. You know, unfortunately, you know, we have this kind of, again, stereotyping a little bit. We're selling a, a, a product to the already fit quite often. You know, so how do we attract the other people? So if we can tell them, so look, it doesn't matter what shape or size you are, you are going to benefit from just being active. It doesn't matter even if you don't lose weight. You Physical know, activity is the king. Yeah, you know, Max, I love that again. Same, same as that last comment that, um, that you made or that last insight that you gave us. I think, again, statistics like that can absolutely be used in our marketing and, and our reaching out to clients. And what I'll do, Tribe, is if Max is happy for me to share, we might even put a reference point to that study in the show notes for this week. So if people want to read a little bit more, because that's some interesting st statistics that you've got there. Yeah, great. I'm very happy to provide those. That'd be Absolutely. great. Thanks, Chantel. Max. Okay, how we're rolling. We're doing well. We're up to number mm. eight. Number eight, very quick one, but a very, very scary fact. Over the last few years, and there was a paper published in 2012 in the journal Lancet, which is one of probably one of the most prestigious journals out there, it's the first time that we're seeing more deaths globally from physical inactivity than from smoking. You know, we've, we've been talking about, you know, sitting is the new smoking, mm -hmm. but quite truly now we're seeing more people dying across the globe from being inactive than from smoking which is a uh, you know, really, really scary stat, especially considering how easy it is to change levels of inactivity. You know what that says to me, Max? It makes me realise just how important our role is as, as fitness professionals to to really make a difference to people's lives and to, to really make sure that we, you know, I guess become the very best possible business owners that we can be so that we can reach more people, we can influence more people and hopefully help people make healthy lifestyle choices choices oh, absolutely Chantel I mean you mentioned I'm on the board of fitness Australia and one of the reasons why I'm there is you know we've got an army of 30,000 registered exercise professionals mm -hmm. um, you know you had Bill Moore on the show on the show last week talking about fitness Australia and the work that it's doing yes we've got this massive army out there three and a half thousand registered businesses um, that can be speaking this language and if we can speak it together we can definitely make a difference yeah that's great okay number nine Point number nine, and this one goes to sleep. Now, the, the data that came out of, obviously, the conference was more related to athletes, but there was an interesting point that may help us with marketing in, in fitness businesses. I mean, firstly, what it looked at is that most athletes, like the general population, are not sleeping enough. 
right? Um, a huge percentage of sleeping, you know, six to well, less than seven hours a night, when ideally we should be sleeping about eight hours a night. Mm -hmm. But what they found is that the earlier in the morning that the athletes trained, the less they slept, right? And I think we can rely, you know, you work, I work, the listeners uh, are in business. We all tend to open up the laptop at 10 o'clock at night time, and it's very hard to get to sleep before 11 o'clock. And if we're training at 6 o'clock in the morning, then we're reducing the amount of sleep that we can have. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the same for a lot of our members. And so perhaps we can sell, you know, and this is the, the businesses will need to be creative because we don't want to stop people coming in before work, obviously. But there is perhaps a message here for those that can come in after 9 o'clock and one of the things that we can sell them is by coming in a little bit later, you actually ensure you get a little bit more sleep as well. Wow, um, that's really interesting. So, you know, again, trying to think about the, the marketing spin and there will be some creative people there that will be able to do something good with that. Or trying to fill those after work times. You know, make sure that you get your sleep in the morning, come in after work and then go home. I might um, just remind everyone at this point, you mentioned uh, earlier as one of your top shows and that was Lisa Maltman's show 39. And yeah. when she talked to us and she was was an expert around, around sleep and sleep behaviour and stuff like that, she actually gave us in that show a couple of tips on uh, healthy sleeping habits. So if anyone missed that show and if that's an area that um, perhaps you know that your clients maybe suffer from lack of sleep or, you know, don't have the energy that they need for their training, that type of thing. I think it's probably really worthwhile you going back and checking out that show because she does give us some great tips around that topic. So, which brings us to number 10. Number 10 and the last one. Look, and this is probably a narrower um, population group, but probably for the cardio addicts and the treadmill addicts um, research uh, I, look and it's been out for a little while but it really came out of the conference as well is the value of resistance training for endurance athletes mm -hmm. so and they looked at elite runners middle distance and long distance runners and the importance of actually doing weights to improve the running performance and um, and it really relates for the nerds in the house listening to the running economy so there's three things that affect your running performance your vo2 max your running economy and your lactate threshold and running economy is very heavily influenced by the strength in the muscle and the recoil in the muscle so again, a, tar a message there for, you know, all the runners are there that are doing the city to base and the, you know, all those kind of fun runs that strength training can be a very good way to actually drop the running times as well. Tribe, I want to say a very special thank you to Max Martin for joining us on today's show. Now, the ESSA conference that Max attended, that happens every two years. So the next one's not until 2018, but we will put a link to the ESSA website on today's show notes. And I'm also going to be including there a link for Movement Screen. As I mentioned earlier when I introduced Max, who is the founder of Movement Screen, by the way, Movement Screen is a first-of-its-kind iPad-based movement screening and assessment software that was developed to help exercise professionals basically provide a better service to clients. So if you want to check that out as well, that link will be on today's show notes. So thanks again very much to Max Martin for joining us on Show 50. Tribe, you listen to our show for your professional development. And this month, thanks to Active Management, you can win an amazing resource for your professional development. It is their monster edition of powerful insights from industry experts, and it's valued at $180, far out. This is an ebook that has 12 interviews, and they are with absolute industry guns. To win, all you need to do is subscribe to the show notes at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com or otherwise engage with us on any Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Okay, so make sure that you jump in and enter for this month because that is an absolutely awesome prize. Now, before I sign off for today, I want to give you a sneak peek at next week's guest and OMG, I was blown away at meeting this man. Seriously, I was on a high for days after this interview. He is absolutely awesome. You guys are going to love this show. And here's a little preview of what you can expect when I did the quick fire five with Jeb Blount. Jeb, first of all, welcome along to the show. Now, are you up for our quick fire five questions? I am absolutely up for quick five questions. Okay, let's get going. So tell us, why do you do what you do? 
I love it. I love it. I'm passionate about it. And I wake up every day and pinch myself because I can't believe I get to do this. And what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Make myself obsolete. Uh, one of my bosses um, told me early on as a leader that if I wanted to grow, that but the key thing was making myself obsolete and all the people around me better. What's a personal habit that helps you become better at what you do? I, I, I make sure that I do at least 15 minutes of professional reading every morning before I start my day. Oh, that's really great advice. And speaking of professional reading, what's one book that you'd recommend and why? I'm reading a book right now called The Conversion Code. So I hate to, to give you a book that's right off the top of my head. It's by Chris Smith. It's fantastic. But the one book, if there was one book that I would give to anybody, uh, it would be Del Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Great recommendation. And tell us this, why should our tribe come back next week and listen to your main interview? Why should they listen to me? Because I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I, I think that, you know, I, if, you're a, if you're a business owner or you're in business, um, because we help businesses get new customers, and that's what I mainly do as a, you know, as a sales acceleration specialist, I think you'll get some great tips that will help you make more money. I think that's a great reason to come back and listen. We look forward to chatting to you next week. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. So, guys, that's just a sneak peek of what you can expect in next week's show. That's show 51 with special guest Jeb Blount. Guys, thanks for joining me once again for another week of the Fitness Business Podcast. And remember, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Great show this week that you should be suffering DOMs, delayed onset mind soreness, as you are overloaded and that's when your mind is strengthened. You and your business have been strengthened thanks to the amazing support of our premier sponsor, Active Management. Check out www.activemgmt.com.au only if you want to strengthen your business and your leadership. Don't forget all today's links and notes are found at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com where you can also subscribe and never miss a show and maybe win a prize. Next week is another incredible guest with Chantal, so get ready for more fit bizpiration.